We're live. Well, a very good day, good evening, uh, a good any time where you are in the world today. You're joining us here to, today for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. It's Sunday afternoon. And if it's the second or fourth Sunday, you're here for our new books showcase featuring poets whose books have launched in this past pandemic year. I'm Sandy Unone, I'm your host and author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And joining you today, as I mentioned, from the Pacific Northwest in uh, the state capital, Olympia, Washington. This is a reading I've patiently awaited for months uh, with a quartet of accomplished poets, um, Hilda Raz, Jean Dubrow, Alana Bell, Minnie Bruce Pratt, as well as the vast subject matters and the range of what we're about to experience in their luminous, voluminous work. Welcome, of course, to those of you joining us live in our Zoom room here today. And hello to those of you watching us live from Facebook for our reading. Last year at this very same time, we were celebrating together the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage with our special poetry event, Votes for Women, a poetry pageant. And um, uh, some of you here in the room were part of that reading and also uh, uh, in the audience. So it's always fun to look back and, and also amazed to think that we've been going well over for a year every Sunday bringing poetry to you from from every corner of the imagination and consciousness and I appreciate those of you who join week after week return week after week to our series as we continue to offer truly unique combinations of writers and thanks once again to all of you who joined us last week for our wild card open mic. What a great, what a great, what a great reading that was. Well, as I mentioned, since March, 2020, we provided a weekly virtual reading for the 2,800 plus members worldwide in our international intersectional and intergenerational Facebook group. Of course, for today's reading, a new book showcase, I hope you'll consider purchasing at least one, if not two, three, or four collections, if your resources allow. Kim Ports Parsons will be posting links to our poets' websites and, and presses where you can pick up their um, newest collections in the chat. And again, we'll be doing that tomorrow on our Cultivating Voices Live poetry page. The chats are live for all of you to send the love to the readers, so please do. And let's get started with today's fabulous quartet. Well, up first is uh, uh, a person who is no stranger to Cultivating Voices, read uh, last uh, in November with uh, Another of her new books, List and Story, uh, it is always a play, and also was a reader in our Votes for Women pageant last year. So it is a pleasure to welcome Hilda Raz back to Cultivating Voices. And here's a little bit that I can share with you about Hilda. Hilda Raz lives in Placitas, New Mexico, and is currently the series editor for Poetry at the University of New Mexico Press. As many of you know, she was for a long time the editor of the most esteemed literary journal, Prairie Schooner. In fact, that was from 1987 to 2010. And during that time founded the Prairie Schooner Book Prizes in Poetry and short fiction. 
all through the University of Nebraska Press. In 1993, she was named the first Lucia professor and editor in, that, in the Department of English at the University of Nebraska. She's a past president of the Associated Writing Programs, and she has published 14 books as a poet, nonfiction editor, writer and editor. You will be hearing today from her new and selected poems, Letter from a Place I've Never Been with the University of Nebraska Press. And it is just an absolute thrill to have you here, dear Hilda Raz. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy Yanone, the truly remarkable Sandy Yanone. I am so glad to be here with all three of the other poets. I couldn't be happier. I'm going to read from my new and it's new and collected poems that Kwame Dawes uh, edited and I'm put together a, a program. Um, I'm going to begin with a poem called Diaspora. I'm a child of the Holocaust. Hitler came to power in 1933. I was born in 1938. Pearl Harbor happened in 1941. My brother was a soldier in the infantry at the European front. And here's Diaspora. The gates were closing and the time was late. In spite of our efforts in the car, our suitcases packed, our coats tossed off, goodbye said, or not to be said, in spite of our efforts in the car. The houses closed, the plants farmed out, goodbye said, or not to be said. The neighbors told, the little ones in their beds. The houses closed, the plants farmed out, the station doors opening on uniform corridors, the neighbors told, the little ones in their beds. We fanned our faces, opened our books. The station doors opening on uniform corridors. And then there was smoke and damp and sky. We fanned our faces, opened our books. We shut the windows, began to move. Then there was smoke and damp and sky. Our suitcases packed, our coats tossed off. We shut the windows, began to move. The gates were closing and the time was late. I'd like to read Names My Mother Knew, which is just literally that, Names My Mother Knew, which is on page 191. Hinda, for Hilda, her mother, and me, and also the cousin with freckles, and the red-haired pixie we visited by boat the summer her mother, Vivian, was pregnant with Peter. Skeezix, her name for my embryonic brother, awash and safe in her tough interior, then Jimmy, the toddler, James, the professor, and Graveside, his full measure, Barton James, ash, buried, again, perfectly safe. Aaron, her daddy, our papa, and Frank from childhood, her beloved. Her sisters, Anne, Jane, Phyllis, and the dolly, she was. David, her brother. The nickname she called us, Shepsily, little sheep, for me. And the habit before sleep of the catalog of the loved ones called to God's attention. Rosetta who helped her clean Harvard Street. George, who set the screens, washed windows, scared us with his false teeth. Dr. Wolens, who diagnosed mumps. Dr. Kershaw, who straightened teeth. Mr. Thumb, who lived in my mouth. She whispered his name before she pulled him out. Mr. Eastman's house, Palmyra, the ice cream place, Canadagua for hot dogs and hamburgs, onion rings. Geneseo Hospital, where we were born. Nana, she was to her grandchildren. Devorah, her Hebrew name. 
Parkinson's patient 723 in the medical study, West End Lane, her Hampstead address, the Flandre, a ship she sailed on, lost with the rest, her favorite novels, all foxed, gone. On 2.35, when I used to reading on such a big book, here's the title poem from the collected poems, Letter from a Place I've Never Been. Where cold was supposed to be, the sun is warm. You've promised no wind. The grass is calm under the snow. The map showed the interior, which is where I am. The trip was long. I knew it would be. From the top of the earth, I saw no mountain, though you promised if the air was clear, the mountain would show. But ribbons of light swirled the vault of the sky. The sun set at four. The sun rose at nine. Moose and sled dogs, exotic creatures, I thought to discover around some corner or other by the salmon processing plant. Never. I brought my sunscreen for a tromp through the woods. No woods, no trees, flat rock that seemed to be granite. Alaska is as far from where I am tonight as Chicago is from Seattle where the layover is long. Or to put it another way, the way of a friend, the distance from LA to New York, a trip I've taken. I'm scared of the cold, of the dark, of the journey, the unfamiliar plants that perk into poems I've read and reviewed, some kind of weed, not jewel weed from Robert Frost. Oh, why did I say I'd travel? The tundra is something strange like a sponge and golden. Okay, I'm moving into <clears throat> the work that some of you know me for. This is called Women and Men, page 231. Women and Men. Women have babies or can or can decide not to use the miraculous machinery. Women walk downtown holding their daughters' hands, or can if they're inclined, each generation adding a link to the chain. Women can work or not at the blessed repetitive tasks of the body, cleansing their flesh of the blood flow, a tender care required in whatever spirit at regular intervals. Women were girls, like boys, fast across the meadow, diving into the pond, or carrying morning after morning the heavy buckets of salt water cut up from the animal sea. Blessed bone, ribs like his, flat brown belly, small nipples, and the growing muscles of the shoulders to lift. Women out for a walk cross paths with men holding red dogs on a leash who strain and bark. Hi, sweetie, calls a woman, smiling on the small Irish setter, dropping down to dog height at a distance. A man walks on, pulling the leash taut against the straining dog, smiles at the dog. The woman walks on, slowly approaching the pair, her palm turned outward toward the dog. The man tugs, the dog skids on the twilight pavement, still hot from the day. He would jump on you, the man says. He'd love to jump on you. The woman walks past, smiling. I'd be afraid, she says. I'd be very afraid. And here's Aaron at work, Rain, on page 243. Okay, this poem introduces my son Aaron, who is an artist at work here on masks. The hypodermic needle refers to the one he uses to inject testosterone. Aaron, as you may know, is a trans man. 
I'm looking. Aaron at work, rain. By the light box propped in the window, bare chested, scars, rosy and artificial sun, he crouches over his workbench. Dental tools in their holder at hand, silver discs, his torch, the tiny saw, light flares, breaks on his earring as he turns his head, frowns, dark eyebrows almost meeting. He takes a watch from his jeans pocket, rubs it absently over his beard, electricity. The brain clinks its beads as his head turns, reading something. Now he rises, goes to the cupboard, mix, mixes wallpaper paste with water. The pile of miraculous papers, shot metal, threaded with linen, he sorts to start a paper mache hypodermic needle he's building on the table, matches to the re real one he used this morning, adds it as a detail to the mask to change the meaning, a revolution, what he's about. Out the window, the black car beads up rain. He never drives it, an emblem, but of what? A memory of pain, his slouching walk just home from hospital? Where is the child whose shoes I bought? Where the bread we needed? Where our kitchen, our dead? And on page 262, Here's another poem you'll recognize in the same context. It's called Sun. He is always saying and telling me something urgent in the same tones I use when I am telling him something urgent, but nobody is listening. We are alike and unalike. I like him, I do. He says he likes me. So what's the problem? The problem is birth. What an opera, the lights, the dais, the cast of characters wearing the same gown. We're both there forever. I am. Where is he? He's left the building, entered the stadium where the team is getting ready to tear each other and everyone apart. Is he garbing up? He says, no but I can see his pads in the backfield, still skin on the cow's back. Io, I think, and he laughs. I, and I was going to give you the gloss for, for Io. Io was the lover of the great god Zeus, you all know that. Her mother changed her to a cow to protect her. So when I am see, seeing Aaron garbing up for the mayhem of, of the life I think he's going to have. I think Io, but he laughs. He gets it. I never say it out loud. That's the connection between us. Okay, I'm going to close with one of the new poems um, because this is a new and collected, God help me. Um, this one is called Victory Garden. Grass skirt. That's on page 435, coming to the back of the book. Victory Garden Grass Skirt. We had one but not the other when I was very little. Mornings before the heat set in, I picked up my yellow trowel, exited through the back door, evading, as usual, my mother. The tomatoes were usually red by the time of the highest heat at noon. I had no intention of picking one and eating it hot juice running down my chin, the smell, the crisp taste of first bites prickling. But you know that I always did. First one, then another, and no one seemed to notice. I grazed vegetable gardens all up and down the neighbor's hills. In junior high, Sue Ellen Smith 
brought from Hawaii the skirt, a sample of vacation ecstasy. She modeled it. We all did, one after another and wiggled. The skirt wiggled too. Hips, who knew? I wanted jiggly breasts, but no, it never happened. My mother's favorite flower was gladiolus in a large vase, in a tall vase. Home from the grocery with a bunch, niveous and gold ones in my arms. I take down her heavy vase from the closet. After my cutting and trimming, propped in a circle, here they are, the only sign of reconciliation in the room, 12 ripe tomatoes in a bowl about to reach perfection in the kitchen. What happened? I don't know. I didn't like that woman and she didn't like me. I was a cruel child. Verbs escape my memory, but our victory garden and Sue Ellen's skirt retain their fragrance. And I too love gladiolus spears, 14 buds on most stalks, and the sight of my mother's hands arranging and changing them in the window, I'm sorry, in the window of my childhood as war raged in Europe and on all fronts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilda. I think of, um, you know, what I think is so powerful about your poetry is the body, it's, it's, it's such a body of work that is rooted, rooted, as we just heard in the Victory Garden, rooted in the particulars of things and so rooted in our bodies all the particulars of the body and how that permeates through time and memory and the precision of those 12 ripe tomatoes and the 14 gladiola buds, the, 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 the large, the largesse, and the infinitesimal coming together through time and memory. And also so appropriation just, and racism and misunderstanding of yeah. uh, essential, necessary truths about the people we most love. Embedded in all my work are the cultural misapprehensions that have caused so much pain to so many, for so many generations, I try hard to make visible those, those terrible misapprehensions and to, and to make fun of them as best I can. Well, again, I can't thank you enough for today and for your body of work over the decades, the collected, the, the new book, just following another new book, List and Story, I always just like to bring List and Story in because it's only just also recently oh, out um, from Stephen. Uh, yeah, just a year. Um, is Letter from a Place I've Never Been. New and Collected. My apologies for saying selected. New and Collected poems 1986 to 2020 from the University of Nebraska Press. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you all for being here and listening. Well, uh, we move next to, again, um, I had methods to my machinations today to um, bring certain poets together. Um, and Jean has a um, connection to Nebraska as well. And I, I knew it would be special to um, have 
her in this particular constellation. And so I'm very, very grateful to be able to hear Jean de Brau's work today and to, you know it, and but for us to hear it today on Cultivating Voices is, is such a, a, a wonderful gift to all of us. Uh, let me share a little bit more about this stunning poet's career and work. Jean de Brau is the author of nine books of poetry, including most recently, Wild Kingdom from Louisiana State University Press 2021. And what a unique collection it is that dives deep into the forms of academia. And I'm going to let uh, her, you're gonna hear what that all means, but it is a fascinating, fascinating uh, look poetically into, uh, into a community and a culture. Well, she's also published book, a book of creative nonfiction, Through Smoke, an essay on notes, and her previous poetry collections include Simple Machines, uh, American Zombies, dot, Dots and Dashes, The Arranged Marriage, Red Army, Red Stateside, From the Fever World, The Hardship Poet, and a chapbook, The Promised Bride. She's also edited two, co-edited two anthologies, The Book of Scented Things, 100 Contemporary Poems About Perfume, and Still Life with Poem, Contemporary Nature's Mortes in Verse. Her poetry and book reviews have appeared everywhere, <laughs> just everywhere, uh, including in poetry, the Southern Review, Pleiades, Colorado Review, and the New England Review. And she is the co founding editor of the National Literary Journal, Cherry Tree. She's been the recipient of a number of awards, including the Alice Fay, the Castigo, De Castagnola Award from the Poetry Society of America, the Adrian Rich Award for Poetry from the Beloit Poetry Journal, and the Sausland Foundation Fellowship from the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She is the professor of creative writing at the University of North Texas. And I'm just giddy to be able to welcome her so that you can hear this really incredible collection, Wild Kingdom. Thanks so much, Sandy. And I'm just so glad to have the opportunity to read today with three um, such wonderful poets. Um, I'm going to be reading some poems from my latest collection, Wild Kingdom. Um, Wild Kingdom is about the strange, terrifying landscape of academia. Um, and we often think of campuses and universities as the ivory tower, these, these far removed places. But the way I try to write about academia in Wild Kingdom is that the, the college campus is a place onto which we project all of our anxieties about um, America today. So our anxieties about gender and sexuality and race and um, everything you can think of. And the book ultimately is really an examination of power, its uses, but especially its abuses. This opening poem is called Syllabus for the Dark Ahead. Throughout this course, we'll study the American landscape of our yard, coiled line of the garden hose, muddy furrows in the grass awaiting our analysis, what's called close reading of the ground. And somewhere, something will yip in pain, perhaps, a paw caught in a wire, or else the furred and oily yowl of appetite. And flickering beyond the fence, we'll see the slatted lives of strangers, the light 
above a neighbor's porch will be a test of how we tolerate uncertainty, the half elimination, a glow that's argument to shadow. Or if not that, we'll write an essay on the stutter of the bulb, the little glimmering that goes before the absolute of night. I actually wrote that poem the night after the 2016 presidential election. I went out into my backyard and I thought about my neighbors and I wondered who they'd voted for and I felt afraid. This is portrait of an administrator with strategic plan and office supplies. To sit on her couch was to be silenced by upholstery, plush muffling of cushions from which it was difficult to rise. Arendt writes, in politics, obedience and support are the same. And for a time, I was obedient. My reports in ordered bullets, collaborations, programs, opportunities. The provost preferred speech contained, a line of staples in a box. I remember the fold between one week and the next. She said to me, these people are unreasonable. She said, these people are quite reasonable. Inside her office, everything was cream. She told me what I heard I hadn't heard. Our last meeting, like a memo full of typos, whited out, then shuffled through the copier machine. Language turned to shiny blurs. Arendt writes, most people will comply. For a time, it was easy to ignore the sharp wedge of the provost's hair. I should have seen she resembled more a letter opener on a desk. How like a knife of the piece of metal looks. I told her what I heard, I heard. I told her that my expertise was words. Arendt writes, the holes of oblivion do not exist. A gifted bureaucrat, the provost taught me truth was thin as paper. The little circles she punched in it remain. And still I hold this punctured story to the light. This next poem I have to warn members of the audience contains um, a number of uses of a particular swear word that begins with the letter F and ends with the letter K. So just be prepared. Self-portrait with cable news, graffiti, weather. When I see the woman on TV, so calm in her porcelain white suit, I remember that I too smiled while man talked over, that I bore the persistent tar of his voice. In those meetings, I watched the veins in his face like cracks in a disappointed street. Were it not for his cruelty, I might have said, I'm sorry for your loss, who knows? That year, my husband would overhear me talking in my sleep, and though he couldn't open the shut door of dreaming, he told me that I said, fuck you into the dark, quite clearly, fuck you. Night and waking were locked rooms, the only exit, a stuck window, and the heat was always going or the cold. Next order of business, a colleague said. I noted every conversation. On the page, no one interrupted. Often remembering that year, I held a serving bowl, touch its surface limbed with flowers, this thing I've dropped or knocked against a shelf, the way it refuses decorative to break. Now I can say fuck you quite clearly to that ear, although there was also the kindness of friends who brought over cherries. They knew I loved the sweetness of a stone. I can say, fuck you, I will not lose the taste for it. In that year I was, truth be told, willing to punch a fist through glass if it meant my escape. I walked down Greenwood Avenue, past the house where someone had sprayed fuck you on the road and someone else had tried to exit out, pale lines on top of lines. 
I understood wanting to write one's fury on a place. I understood even the impulse to erase it, walking each day across that imperative, how it disturbed the concrete silence. Most of us are not the woman on TV who keeps talking while the man is shouting wrong into a mic. She keeps talking while he stands behind her like a mugger in an alleyway and who knows what, it want, what he wants to take. Most of us are the audience watching the debate. We comply when the moderator says no applause, no interruptions, please. Most of us wait for night to write fuck you on a clean patch of asphalt. All of this to say I could have said much more. I could have written something on the man's sad face. I think of him. I think of Greenwood Avenue, its unremarkable houses that I learned to hate, always moving toward a meeting or coming late from one. I think of the sound that spray paint makes, the rattle shake of the can, the aerosol's soft hiss, the words emerging slowly on a path, jagged perhaps, but large enough, remaining legible through rain. And this next poem is, um, was inspired by watching the, the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, for many years, as the poem is going to say, I served um, on a college honor board, so I heard many kinds of cases having to do with sexual assault. Um, this is called After Crying. For years on the college honor board, I asked about the body and its boundaries. Who owns that place? Who enters it? And then the respondent, as he, would call, as he was called, would arrange his mouth into a room of grief. On the TV, a woman is remembering a hand across her face. She thought that he might kill her accidentally. Indelible, she says, in the hippocampus is the laughter. The past is a hallway that the mind cannot escape. For years on the honor board, I spoke with men. They talked about themselves as boys with names like Matt or Brett who held their power casually in the same easy way they might have carried cans of beer through a party. A man is weeping on the screen today. Even now he's secure in his confidence like one of those houses on a sheltered street where the trees go on for miles. On the honor board, I saw how we judge the worth of lamentation. The men with their shuttered eyes, their bodies unbreachable, we place their tears in bright decanters on a mantelpiece. We spill the tears of women in the garden to water the silky roses and the vines. So of course this book is based on hard earned personal experience. And when I left the academic institution that was the inspiration for this book, um, this is the poem I kind of wish I'd written. Uh, it's called Exit Report. In this report, the poet will retrieve her heart from the gods. You'll know her heart by the way it was feasted on. In this report, she'll unchain her wrists from the rock. When the ocean arrives, she'll already be gone. In this report, she'll guide her ship unruined through a strait of teeth and swirling, reporting she won't be a monster at the heart of a maze or will be monstrous and follow the thread, rescue her bullheaded body from the punishment of kings. In this report, she won't be held in the downy smothering of a swan. Nothing will trick her with desire's shifting shape. What she reports will make everything gold. The table where she sat so many years, the years themselves now hardened in their cruelty. Such glimmering in this report. Nor will she be turned to stone when facing herself in the polished shield of this report. The snakes of her won't stop their hissing. In this report, the wax won't melt, 
her wings incapable of not beating. Look how she loves the heat, the feather singe, and the water far below, like a darkness she is leaving. And this is fairy tale with laryngitis and resignation letter. You remember the mermaid makes a deal, her tongue evicted from her throat and moving is a knife cut with every step. This is what escape from water means. Dear colleagues, you write, for weeks I've been typing this letter in the bright kingdom of my imagination. Your body is a ship of pain. Pleasure is when you climb the rocks and watch the moonlight touching everywhere you want to go, a silver world called far away. Dear colleagues, you write, this place is a few sentences contained by the cursor's rippling barrier. What happened here is only beaks and brackets, the seraph's liquid stroke. The old story has witches, a prince in love with the surging silence of women, a knife that turns the water red. You write, dear colleagues, now these years are filed in the infinite oceans of bureaucracy. Everything bleaches or fades. In other words, goodbye. Sometimes it's possible to walk. Although you've been told inside the oyster shell of your heart, there is no soul. Creatures like you must end with a spray of salt, green droplets floating breathless in the air. And I'm going to close with the last poem in the book, which was actually the first poem I wrote for the collection. When I arrived here in Texas, I fell in love with these um, dark birds that are everywhere called grackles. Um, and I just thought they were the most beautiful, resilient creatures. And I thought that they were um, who I wanted to be. So this is song for a grackle in the Kroger parking lot. Don't hate the scavenger. In daylight, it's purple stained, iridescence of oil spilled on asphalt, its body like a rag wrung out. Love instead that groups are known as plagues, a grievances. Love the reflective eye that stares, how everywhere is home. Time has a way of driving over us. Love the choice the grackle makes to tear the silver insides of a candy wrapper, to pick apart the leavings, to sing and sing despite the rusted metal of its throat. Thank you. Just, just astounding, as astounding as when I read the book and relate to the compliance and obedience, that the notion of compliance and obedience in academia and what that does and doesn't tell us about power, what it leaves, what it actually profoundly leaves out, all the memos and the reports and the, let the forms. And, um, and I, I, I dare to say uh, that anyone can think of office supplies the same way again after hearing the poems in Wild Kingdom. Um, what, uh, what, and really what, uh, what an investigation into something that isn't, uh, is not looked at critically enough. Thank and you. so beautifully poetic, so beautifully poetically. Thank you. Wow. Oh my gosh. Great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, folks, I told you this reading um, today uh, was going to just be just incredible, incredible reading. We're halfway through and like already I'm to the moon, already to the moon. But next we're gonna to travel to another country.
We're going to travel with Alana Bell, who is the author of Mother Country, her newest collection from BOA Editions. These are poems about fertility, motherhood, and mental illness. And Alana also, in bringing that to the forefront, is the founder of the Mother Artist Salon, where she, continue, where she uses her vision to be in conversation with others on these topics. Her debut collection of poetry, Eyes, Stones, also from Louisiana State University Press in 2012, received the 2011 Walt Whitman Award from the Academy of American Poets. I hope you've had a chance to engage, be in community with that collection as well. Alana is the rep recipient of grants and fellowships from the Jerome Foundation, the Edward Albee Foundation, and the Brooklyn Arts Council. Her writing has appeared again widely, of course, in places like Anya, the Harvard Review, the Massachusetts Review, and she was an inaugural finalist for the Freedom Plow Award for Poetry and Activism, an award that recognizes and honors a poet who is doing innovative and transformative work at the intersection of poetry and social change. In addition to facilitating her own creative fire workshops, Alana teaches poetry to actors at the Juilliard School and sings with the Resistance Revival Choir, a group of women activists and musicians committed to bringing joy and song to the resistance movement. Would you please welcome the illustrious Alana <laughs> Bell. Uh, and and industrious, <laughs> illustrious and industrious. I just love, it's like also kind of embarrassing to hear bios to sit, like, I don't know if anyone else has experience, like, this isn't, but thank you for being such a beautiful host and for creating this gorgeous series and honoring Poets New Books. And I'm so honored to read with Hilda and Jean and Minnie Bruce and um, just thrilled to be here. So um, I'm going to actually open with a song, if that's okay. So, uh, and then we'll move into the poems. So here we go. can make it sweet again you can make it sweet again even when you feel like part of you has died you can make it sweet again you can taste the honey on your tongue you can taste the honey on your tongue even when you're sure that the bitterness has come you can taste the honey on your Even 
Even when it feels like an impossible life, you can learn to love your own life. Miracle. What else to call the way the bare branches I'd bought at the neighborhood bodega came back to life that winter? I carried them home, dry, wrapped in paper, stuck them in the square vase, and as an afterthought, filled it with water. I don't know when I noticed the pale pink shoots sprouting from the submerged ends, wild reaching roots like ginseng or the hair on an old woman's chin. Then, tiny green leaves began to appear at the tips, curling over themselves with the sheer effort of growing. I thought they were dead. And now I recall being in the grip of a darkness I did not have a name for and didn't think I'd survive. I could try to describe it for you now, the nights I woke with my pulse pounding through, the heaviness of each breath, how the effort of being inside my body felt like burning. What I really want to tell you is this, how in the parch of that long drought, the people I loved kept bringing me water. Water, though I turned my back and did not answer to my name, though I flung the cup away, let me say it plain, I wanted to die. But something in me, some tiny bulb still alive under all that rotted wood kept drinking, kept right on drinking. Dropping my mother off at the electroconvulsive therapy ward. Do I look strange, she asks. The other patients with their flyaway hair and unblinking eyes wander the floor. You look like a movie star. The nurses suggest I get some air. Her eyes widen as I edge toward the door, leaving her in gloved hands, quick for a cure. As a girl, I followed her down any steep or muddied path. I catch my face in the sharp fluorescence of the bathroom mirror. Have my dark eyes darkened? Was that shadow there before? Who will I follow when she is gone? When they wheel her back to me, faint bloom of urine on her gown. What happened in that room while I drank coffee just outside the door? Mother, I've done what you would never do. Walked you to the edge, then turned away. Blackout. New York City, 2003. My mother calls to tell me it's her fault. Her black, black thoughts the cause of this city gone dark. Each window a blank eye in the stone. The lost bodies below swarming hot concrete. Black as Hitler, she whispers through the wire and the steam rises from a grate in the street. I tell her how last night on our block, folks gave away beer and ice cream and all the meat they couldn't cook, and for the first time in years, the Milky Way was visible. I did that, she asks. Elegy for Mother, Still Living, and the epigraph is by Jack Gilbert. The Lord gives everything and charges by taking it back. I was formed inside the body of a woman who wanted me as she wanted her own life, allowed to drink the milk made only for me. I was given mother love, its bounty and its cocoon of those first years without language. It is right to mourn the rocky hills of Crete where we walked, my small hand in hers for hours. The hidden beach where we swam naked then baked on the fine sand. Lazy afternoons in her lap, her thick hand stroking my curls. Her fingers have stiffened. Her eyes 
the eyes of an animal in pain. I hold my mother against the woman she is. So as Sandy mentioned, um, the poems in this collection are, uh, and I'm just reading a, a few different um, sort of threads. Uh, so about my relationship with my mother and her illness, about my own struggles with um, mental illness, and also about my journey towards becoming a mother. And something that is really epidemic uh, right now is uh, sort of struggles with fertility that many women have. And it's not talked about. There's a lot of shame around it, a lot of sort of sense that like, you know, you're not, whatever, there's biblical implications of why that is. But um, so, uh, so this, um, I, I'm going to share some poems about that part of the journey. First intrauterine, excuse me, first intrauterine insemination. It was not making love, but we held hands anyway and looked into each other's eyes and not at the gloved hands as the tube went in. Alone, in the cold room, I rest with my feet in the air and picture the light entering my body. I name it Surya, meaning sun. There's a storm coming. Soon this whole city will fill with white, a blank field. I will go out into the morning before the plows, out into the thick quiet and crouch, letting the dark fluid spill out of me to mark the baby that did not come. I will bury it like an animal. This time I do not give it a name. All month the blood collected in my uterus as if in a bowl. It drains out slowly, staining the hotel robe with my body's rust. This time the blizzard does not surprise. Through the window, I watch snow swirl and cover the tops of buildings, the slick black street below. Nothing is new. Not this storm. Not my blood. Not these words. Letter to my son in utero. You are not the first. Before you, another seed took hold. And every morning your father rubbed my belly in wonder at what she would become. When the doctor said, no heartbeat, the air went out of me. My dead baby, I thought. They would not call it that. Embryo, 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 they said. A padded word meant to keep me from what I knew. Something had lived in me its whole small life and was gone. Forgive me for loving another before you. Forgive me also the weight of my love for you, already heavy with death. Forgive me. I am a Jew. In the middle of the celebration, I always smash the glass. And I just have uh, two more. Invocation for my unborn. Little bird, little invisible, do you feel the pull of my silent song? Little bird, little beating heart, I cut my hands to make a world for you. Come, come, little one, yes, I call for you out loud without shame. Again, I open to the tide of tiny swimmers and pray one reaches center. I've made my heart into a bowl for you, hungry teacher, little grower from between the worlds. I call you with all my breath and muscle with this body meant to fill with you. I call you from my tunneled center, my millions of eggs, any of which could be you. Call with my blood river, my throat and fat hands with cooking spoon and iron pan. Little one, little bird, I feed with my mouth, particle grown from seed, treasure, little mystery, little all the names I do not know. Little you, I cannot find in all my folds. Little second heartbeat, I swear I hear when I stand at the shore. Little all the names I've named you in my second tongue, and all your names mean light. 
little stranger. Greedy bee, your absent wings tickle my womb. Little rib formed from my rib, little sexless fish in dark waters, little anchor tossed from the wooden boat of our loving, little poem I do not have the words for, little incantation come, come through the sea that knows your names, through black night with its stars for eyes, through the wind and all its directions. Let it blow you home. So I'm going to just close with this last poem. And as you can hear in these poems, the longing for the child was so great. And then the child comes and it's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I didn't know what I was signing up. So this poem is called Prayer, and I'm going to just give a, um, as Jean demonstrated, uh, there's a curse word in here that starts with A and ends with whole. So just be prepared. <laughs> um, prayer. When you are crying, and I don't know why, when I cannot soothe or quiet you, when my nipples are sore and cracked from your merciless mouth, or when you refuse the breast, when I finger the purple stretch marks across my thighs and belly, the loose skin, the blood vessels burst around my eyes and cheeks and asshole, which are because you are. When I stink of puke and milk and shit, when I begin to lose my grown-up words from lack of use, when you push the cup of blended yams I've just prepared on the floor for the third time this week, and it isn't an accident, because you looked right at me before you sent it over the edge of your high chair. When I am on my knees before you, little ruler, begging you to eat, to sleep, to piss in the bowl, let me remember those many nights on my knees, praying to another god, begging for you to come, for life to take hold inside of me and bloom. Thank you. Oh, I, um, I honestly, I just, I don't want this reading today to end. <laughs> Kim, I see you shaking your head. Just from the first incantation of your voice, the song, the learn to love your own dark. And from that, we add the adjectives to you. Lumina, luminous, such luminosity that you brought in the soaring and the searingness of those poems of, or to, about, within the body, rooted again in the body and how we emerge from the body, body and soul. Thank you so what, much. What an absolutely um, beautiful, powerful reading from wow, the latest book, <laughs> Mother Country. There it is. I've I look at I look at the cover often. I also also. Thank you for bringing voice to the poems for me because reading them is one thing and hearing them is a completely otherworldly experience. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I'm so happy and honored to be here. Thank you. Well, as I said, folks, I really don't want the reading to end, but if it has to end, I couldn't ask for a better ending. <laughs> I couldn't ask for a better beginning, middle, or end to this reading today. Oh my gosh. Um, because uh, we will now get to hear from poet, activist, humanist, mother, lover, every, every you know, Minnie Bruce will put in all the nouns and is any noun I could say, and so many more. Um, but I do want to highlight that 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 
that activism that that is that is born from being um, in the world and um, and what comes from the struggle of being in the world and and loving from within that struggle. So the more, a little more about Minnie Bruce Pratt for those of you not familiar. Born in Selma and raised in Centerville, Alabama, Minnie Bruce Pratt came out as a lesbian in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 1975. This was the year after segregationist George, Governor George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door and her books and poems have received awards from the Academy of American Poets, the American Library Association, the Poetry Society of America, Lambda Literary, and the Publishing Triangle. Her second book, which was the first book that I was introduced to, Crime Against Nature, uh, changed my view of poetry, is about losing custody of her children as a lesbian mother. And it was a New York Times notable book of the year. An anti-racist and anti-imperialist women's liberation activist, Pratt co-authored another book, central in my library, and I hope in all of yours, Yours in Struggle, Three Feminist Perspectives on Anti-Semitism and Racism from 1984 with Barbara Smith and Ellie Balkin. It is, it is, it is truly a, a, a book that one must have and remains direly relevant. Her essay from that volume, Identity, Skin, Blood, and Heart, has been adopted for hundreds of college classrooms as a teaching model for diversity. And she's also, along with these two amazing writers, Christos and Audre Lorde, received the Lillian Hellman Dashiell Hammett Award given by the Fund for Free Expression to writers who, quote, have been victimized by political persecution. She is the managing editor of the Workers' World Mundo Obrero newspaper and lives in her hometown in Alabama and in central New York. And her most recent book, which I've had the, um, the most moving experiences hearing her read from um, since its release is, is Magnified from Wesleyan, released in March of this year. It's dedicated to her partner and spouse, Leslie Feinberg, the trans activist and theoretician. It is, uh, again, thank you for being with us today. Um, I, I can't wait to share, have you share the poems of Magnified with this audience. Um, and thank you for all you bring to your work, life and being. Thank you so much, Sandy, for that very generous introduction and to all the other poets. I, I was just listening to everyone and, you know, thinking about political struggle, right, that, that is in all of your poems um, and how, you know, how when we're in, when we're in the struggle and we're doing political work, things can really flatten out often. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, sometimes we need to do that for clarity. But I was just appreciating with everyone's reading how three-dimensional you made the struggles of life with, you know, a very sharp political perspective in everyone's poems. Uh, on different on different issues, right? The way things can flatten out into issues instead of being about bodies and 
what happens to us uh, in our hearts. Um, and I was just, I, I was being so appreciative of that in everybody's work. And, and the fact that us listening to you could come into your life and be in that struggle with you through the poems. And it, 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 it does connect to this book um, because I, I wrote these poems over a long period of time when Leslie was very ill. And a lot of what I asked myself when I was, when I was writing them was what difference does poetry make? because we knew she was very ill and there were many times when we thought she would die before she did die. And of course, I was saying to myself, why, why, what difference does a poem make? What difference does a poem make? Um, when there's so many very practical, specific things that need to be fought with the transphobia and the medical system you know, the doctor who throws you out of the emergency room because your body's wrong. You know, those are very specific things to fight against. So what good is the poem? And of course, I, I understood by writing the poems that they were helping me save my life and helping me keep going. And that's what I heard in your poems too. But I really felt it during the during this process for Leslie, and also during this last year of the pandemic. Um, I, you know, when I wrote the poems, I would go outside and I would walk around just trying to find something to help me keep going. I know that's been true for so many people this year. How do we keep going in the middle when, you know, the powerful voices are saying, brushing it off or, or not take or not really admitting that we are in peril and we're doing our you know we we us here are doing our human best to survive it uh, and I really did learn that poetry helps us to survive it helps us to keep living and I re remembered again what I learned early on which is that the will to keep living is not a little thing at all. It's huge, the will to keep living. And that, that especially those of us who, go, who have lived through specific oppressions, and there are many different kinds, we need help to want to keep living sometimes. We really do. And poems can give us that. And these are poems that help me keep living some of them Leslie heard. I wrote all of them while she was alive, except one, the last poem I'll read. Um, so these are from Magnified. This is the first poem in the book. Oh, death. Someone sang, oh, death. Oh, Death, won't you pass me over for another day? Someone said, I dreamed of you last night. I dreamed you were telling me your whole life story. Whole world, Welkin, Winkle, Wrinkle. The loop of time holds us all together. A pile of laundry on the bed. You folding socks, one into the other. We have had this day and now this night. The clothes are put away and from the bed we see the moon folding light into darkness, not death. The Great Swamp. That spring, you and I leaned over the edge, staring into the swamp. What was in there? Amphibian eyes glinting like treasure in the water, gold dots of pollen flecking a sodden carpet. That spring, we saw you were beginning to die. 
the arrowhead leaves flew slowly up green out of the murky water. You got sick and sicker. We leaned, our shadows reached into the water. We looked down into the mud past where we'd seen to where what could be lived, waiting to come. getting through the night. At twilight in the fold of this day's pall, you lift the bed covers up and I climb in. The bed is a cave, the sheets cool as stone. The bed is a nest we fold flesh into, belly to back, knee to knee fold, wrist bone to hand. Our ribs brace the bed, a boat to carry us into through the little death that lives in every night. I wake again at 3 a.m. Our cardboard boxes sit unpacked in every room, taxes, losses, old dishes, death, but you still breathe beside me. If I can put each thing into its place, then there will be a place for the boat to land where the, dock, where the clock doesn't tick, where the body is unlocked from pain, where the wood thrush sings again after the rain. Saved voice messages. The automated voice says 21 days to erase. All of your calls are filed into some cyber drawer. The one about the eagle, the ones about the snow, the miners' strike, Mumia, student protests in Arizona. The one where you say, don't mind that Aaron, come home and get loved up. The one when you hope the bus ride wasn't rough. You fold all your electromagnetic energy into the digital envelope and send yourself to me. The last one, when you sound so sick. I hit save, 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 but I can't save everything. Today I have 11 messages of us traveling through time together where there is yet no end. Now we are rushing. Now the current has us. Now we are rushing, motionless on the couch. No matter how close I clasp you, I can hear the edge. The water slips silently over and explodes below in the loud mist. The end close and closer. My little gestures to block shape time, useless. the more sunlight against the gray outside vagueness. The night of my hand folding and unfolding caress across your back until we sleep, until we deliquesce. Water to water, every gesture lost in the torrent that claims us. And these words, all that's left of my bending over you every morning, this morning, my mouth on your mouth, the unspoken, the farewell, the truth that nothing of us will be left to know the other. Rain words. Every morning this walk, a habit now, the words written down one foot after another. The sodden white petals turn brown, the tender pages disintegrate. I walk on, I follow the present into the next word, what might return after you are gone, return you to me 
in the future, the moment before I go out the door, the two of us together in the patter of rain, you turn over so I can kiss you goodbye. You say to me, yes, leave the window open. The air smells so sweet. Do not seek to remain. I'm reading Marx in the Eastwood McDonald's. Fleetwood Mac is singing, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Marx is saying, do not seek to remain something formed by the past, but in the absolute moment of becoming. The words are ripping up the moment and I fall into a tomorrow without you. No morning, no night, no sleeping, no waking, no dawn on your shoulder talking about what is the present. How do I go on? The way yesterday a tree shook its small crescents of seed, angled for planting, sickled for reaping red in the blue sky. The answer in things, not words, but I yearn to talk to you without end about what makes that beauty and what that beauty makes of us. Hargrove Shelves. The habit of living taken away, the green chalked with white dust like grief, like death on the way to the river. To lose a person like you who can say the eternal nature of changing matter, who longs to go ahead to see who will be on earth in a year, in a million years. The sun overthrows the cool, the rain, the river struggles with the shoals and breathes out the rapids, breathes out, out the river breathes in. So quietly I can't hear. To lose a person like you who can say the terrible beauty. If you were here, you'd see how the coal dust rhymes the river edge in black sand. You'd see the lump Longed miners drinking beer in the shade, panting for their breath. The people who just drove up, their child runs down to the worn shoals broad as a spillway and says, we can wade in the shallows or maybe shadows. Everything is in motion, the leaf shadows hurry. Everything is in motion here at Hargrove Shoals. The wind begins to make its afternoon way down the river. The child counts to see how many times. 53 times there is no before and no after. Eternal nature of changing matter, the terrible beauty. Turning the switch off, habit, the key and the ignition, and no, maybe never thought about why, what happens next. Turn down and onto Almond Street, sun into shadow, under the overpass, then the red light and sun gnawing at my ear. The comfort of habit, not psychological. The pileated cackle every year in the old magnolia, rejoicing the chambered seed cone has opened the plump lick. What habit gives us and when it fails. Deshabi says there were two seasons, wet and dry. The farmers knew time out of time when to plant until now. The drought, the weather has changed its habit. Or maybe something else has changed the mind of the climate. 
We were watching Norma Ray yesterday holding hands. The mill hands reached out and turned each switch off. How hard to break the habit of work. Obedience not to machines, but to those who own them. The hand reaching out to take its own, bringing the fragment, the red seed delicious to the mouth. Closed. The treading, the treadle of work, the going back and forth between what is and what could be, me trying to keep up. Before dawn, but warmer today and rainy, so this poem's coat is mottled and splotched as first light shows through its thin cover. Pulling that over you as you stay from your sleep. Go out and live. I go. I leave you inside your pain brocaded skin, the skin draped in sweat. Every morning you wake up clothed in pain. At night, there's no taking that off to put on a sleeve of poetry. No buttoning you up safe with one more murmured word. That won't work. Trout. The green is growing and dying along the walk. Grass mown hay and the clover bloom debris, handful of perfume broken in my hand. When I get home, you folded up, bent on the couch, harder and harder to get up the graph of your decline written onto the years we held each other. When I leave you and come into my room, the floor is held together by braided coils of some unknown person's work. The books are shriveling up on the shelves. Waiting for the ferry. There's a place where the road drops down to the river. People waited there for the ferry once, for someone to come. Now we're going down together. At night, the trees are all darker shades. The night sky makes the river silver. You've never seen that road. I've never made that crossing. The limestone shoals stick up in the water, sharp as your bones under your skin. You need me to help you stand up or sit in smaller and smaller places. The bed, no bigger than a rowboat. not finished. The drops of rain wait in the yellow tulip poplar leaf, fallen but not yet gone. Waiting in the hollow, waiting for the sun on the dried up surface, not falling down. Waiting to be gathered up into larger, into speckled, scattered flecks of matter, flakes, Flesh, flesh, something not finished. Field of vision test. Center, periphery, sparkles I set my eyes to catch. On my scrim of memory, we move again, drive miles to the darkest spot and lie down in the cold. The sky wrinkles as we look up and see fiery tears in the night. We let the stars fall down on us for hours. The fire in us 
leaps up to meet debris disintegrated into light. Smoke trails, swarms of meteors, bee flights of light. In our eyes, oblique sight that after image lingers. The destroyed glory, the speckled dust of the universe still falls on us as the implacable day advances ray by ray. And these are the last two I'll read. These are the last two poems in the book. In the end, what is left to say? In the end, you died. And with your last mouthful of breath, you carried away the person you had been. You took away the person I was with you. At the end, you said, this time I know I am going and you are staying. But someone unknown to me was the one who survived saying, if we're still alive. The forward. After how we have to go over and over things. Repeat, beaten path. Repeat to bury or uncover. The same story told to the same person again, again, again. Yet another of these poems about death, yes, again. Survival by repetition. The effort behind the smell of cut grass, the swing back, the push. The crisscross of dying blades, you and me lying down on the grass after that long, hot march, hand in hand on the cool ground, and then pain, our muscles seized to the bone. We almost can't get up, but we do. Pain and the body's memory, the going on of all the other marches, the forward. Thank you for letting me read with you. <sighs> I like to leave a little bit of room when I hear these poems. So, so just gonna leave a little bit of silence for a moment for folks to absorb. Just really the um, the infinitely moving poems in magnified that, you know, answer that question or question, the facets of answering that question, how do I go on? I really think of them as facets to like gems and Lucy Brock Broido used to call them terrible crystals. Uh, and that reminded me of the terrible beauty, those, those facets of, the way you look at this question and the and really the intimate way that we're brought through the door with you of death, life, and love. It's it's um, I mean, there's just no, there's no other word for me to say other than just I've been profoundly moved and I'm 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 grateful that someone would share their journey with me in the way that you have. What, a, what an incredible gift.
Thank you, Mary Bruce. And thank you, Leslie. Thank you for gathering us together. Yes. Everyone who's been here today, oh my gosh, my friends, I uh, invite you to unmute and show your deep appreciation for Hilda, Jean, Alana, and Minnie Bruce. Um, again, I, 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 the reading certainly did not disappoint me, and I certainly, I can't imagine there was any disappointment in this <laughs> fabulous quartet of people that came together to, to share all these facets of, 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 of really life, love, death, the body rooted in the, as I said, in the body and the actions of the body that create um, the actions of what we need to survive amongst all of the different depressions that are amongst us through time. So if you would please unmute and yeah. we appreciate Bravo. it. Yeah. Yay. Oh, good oh, amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Strong poetry throughout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very big moving love, reading. Today. Big love to everyone. Yes, indeed. Big good love. Good. <laughs> well, if any of you have any um, upcoming readings or announcements, or have anything you'd like to share with the group, this is a good time to type them in the chat. A reminder that also all of the poetry that you heard today, of course, uh, can be reread by purchasing Hilda, Jean, Alana, and Minnie Bruce's new collections, but as well look up their look up their other work as well. It's very, very powerful poetry that they have been manifesting and bringing forth um, to audiences for, um, for decades. So I want to invite you to certainly, certainly patronage these new collections, but I think that they will be portals to their previous work as well. And, and I can't, um, I really can't endorse you exploring um, their work uh, any more than I could endorse anything. <laughs> I wanna remind everybody that um, I've been very partial to this quotation from Muriel Rukeyser in The Life of Poetry, that exchange is creation and the human energy involved is consciousness. And again, um, no better display of that idea of exchange being creation and, and involved in consciousness than what we witnessed, heard, and experienced today. So I want to invite you all to, you know, bring your poetry, your humanity, your consciousness to exchange and intersect um, in community next Sunday when we return with beautiful reading from the anthology Fog and Light, poems about San Francisco. The Editor of Blue Light Press, Diane Frank, will bring a bridge of poets to us from the Bay Area, from the anthology to share. It's, I've, I, it's a really beautiful anthology, and I've been able to go to readings before uh, the release and for the, um, the release party for the, for the anthology, and um, it's a beautiful beautiful, beautiful collection and uh, celebrating poetry through the lens of a geography, an area. And uh, I, think you'll, I think you'll really enjoy the, the reading so much. 
And also on Labor Day, a little heads up, um, we're going to take a Sunday off, but we're going to come back on Monday, September 6th, which is also Rosh Hashanah. Um, please join us for our second annual reading from the anthology Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Occupy the Workspace, with co-editor Carolyn Wright, who I believe is in the room today. It's going to be a grand reading that really supports our mission here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry to share poetry that expands our understanding and connections with each other. And then all today, you, we have been really gifted with um, four new books that have come out in during the pandemic. And in September, you'll get to hear new books from these poets. Lori Wilson, Darla Himmelis, Grace Cavalieri. Kenneth Stephen will be joining us from Scotland. Carolyn Wright will be here with her latest collection. Claire Kelly will be joining us from Canada. Jim Selar and Marge Sizer. Um, that's, so we have some really great collections to share with you during the month of September. A reminder that you can register for all of our Cultivating Voices live poetry readings on the event pages as you did today. And um, you can join us here in Zoom as you have today, or of course, watch us live from our Facebook group page. I just have like so much heart and oh, so much love to send out to everyone today for this beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to have been able to share the time with you. And thank you always to Don Krieger for being, uh, for being Don and helping produce this program week after week. And of course, also to Kim Ports Parsons for making visible the program through her beautiful graphics that help us um, promote the work. I hope everyone has a really, um, a very good week. There's so much going on in the world that is full of strife and difficulty and challenge. But remember poetry, um, you know, poetry is that thing that can help us go on. And I know, as I put in the chat, every single week, poetry is, is it's kind of this beacon. Every Sunday is sort of this beacon for me if as I move through the week and I know I can come back to the poetry. So I hope you'll come back to poetry again with us next Sunday. And of course, pick up a book whenever you can, whenever you're feeling lost or, or you know, just in, in, in crisis, poetry will be there. I can assure you there's a poem there for you always, always. Be well, everybody. And we'll see you very, very soon. Much gratitude. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.